Bonjour tout le monde, euh, il est 10 heures, euh, c'est l'heure de l'Atlantique, puis euh, nous allons commencer. Je m'appelle Bernard Degg, euh, je travaille pour Ressources naturelles Canada, Service Canadien des forêts, et puis je vais modérer cet, at à cet uh, atelier. Good morning everyone, uh, it's 10 o'clock Atlantic time, so we'll get started. Uh, my name is Bernie Daigle, I work with Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forest Service, and I'll be the, the moderator for the session. First thing, uh, we have simultaneous translation available. Um, you'll find an interpretation button at the bottom right of your screen. And by clicking on this button, you can choose French or English and listen to the presentation in the language of your choice. Um, this year, all of the presentations will be in English. Premièrement, nous avons un service de traduction. Uh, vous trouverez une icône d'interprétation en bas et à droite de votre écran. Uh, en cliquant sur cette icône, vous pouvez choisir d'écouter uh, soit en français ou en anglais. Uh, et puis cette année, toutes les présentations seront en anglais. Uh, je vais maintenant continuer en anglais. We ask that everyone wait until the end of the presentations to ask their questions. Um, you can ask your questions using the uh, Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. And of course, uh, you can ask your question either in French or in English. Uh, I know that we have a wide range of participants, uh, woodlot owners, municipal leaders, research scientists. Uh, this workshop is primarily intended uh, as an information session for the public. Uh, it's not a scientific conference, so that we, we ask that the questions uh, that are of a more technical or scientific nature be taken up with the presenters uh, after the workshop. Um, one last thing, uh, we ask that the presenters speak slowly, uh, that'll allow the interpreters uh, enough time to do their work. Uh, I'll now pass it over to uh, Drew Carlton for some opening remarks. Go ahead, Drew. Thank you, Bernie. And uh, I'm going to try to share my screen here now and see if we can't uh, get this presentation rolling. So can you see me okay here now? Looks good, Drew. Great, thank you. So good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today for today's presentations, as Bernie said. My name is Drew Carlton, and I'm the manager of the Forest Health section for the province of New Brunswick. And I'm also the current chair of the communications uh, uh, committee for the Healthy Forest Partnership. I want to start by first thanking Bernie, who's a knowledge transfer specialist with Natural Resources Canada, who will be moderating for us again this year. And uh, it's, a, it's a greatly appreciated that uh, you're doing that work. Today, we're here to provide some updates on the work that the Healthy Forest Partnership uh, Early Intervention Strategy has been doing. Um, we've been saying for several years now that this is the first of its kind uh, research program, but now we're in the ninth year. And uh, it's truly remarkable that uh, a project like this is, is actually um, um, been so successful. Um, and you know, it's it's remarkable to see any kind of research program of this duration in this day and age. So before we dive into the presentations, I do want to give a, a quick preface by saying that, you know, because this is our ninth year, uh, ninth time doing one of these annual presentations, and over the course of those years, we've done hundreds of presentations uh, as either provincial representative, representatives or research scientists, or even industry representatives. So there's a little bit of an expectation that uh, uh, throughout these years that our audience has a little bit of background on what the program is, um, and primarily, you know, the rationale behind it, um, our objectives in conducting this this research, and hopefully some of or many of the terms that we we tend to use when we're speaking about EIS, uh, spruce budworm, L2 those sorts of things. Um, so with that in mind, um, you know, we're going to skip a little bit of what we would often call the EIS 101, uh, the real basic um, language behind, you know, what is the program and how do we sample uh, those sorts of things. And we're going to spend more of our time um, talking about the current situation um, in, in the province of New Brunswick 
uh, Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia. Um, and we're going to spend some time focusing on um, some of the current research interests that are that are um, being conducted. Um, for any of the more um, uh, basic information um, that you may be interested in, I would encourage you to visit the Healthy Forest Partnership website, where uh, there's lots of information on the research um, that we've we've been doing from day one. It's it's kind of uh, rationale and uh, and how to speak to the researchers, get in contact with the researchers who are doing um, doing this work. So as I said, um, we're in our ninth year, um, and therefore this is the ninth time we've had an open house or a, a, a virtual open house. Um, and just as uh, our approach to these open houses have changed throughout the years or throughout the phases of EIS, um, so too has the research that has shaped the foundation of the program. Um, as we've le learned new things about how the budworm outbreaks seed and spread, we have also begun to understand the impacts EIS has on outbreak dynamics. Um, the research questions have evolved to address growing complexities of climate change, habitat usage, carbon sequestration, ecosystem services, and non-target effects. And so the research continues to refine our understanding of foundational questions about uh, treatment eff efficacy and moth migration, but it also expands to these more um, complicated questions. Today's also the first open house that we can really speak with certainty uh, about phase three funding. So although we're a couple years into phase three, it's taken some time to get these agreements in place. Um, and so uh, today, um, some of the research you'll hear about uh, will be based on, on some well-established projects. Um, Dr. Rob Johns will speak to some of the efficacy work that's been going on since day one. Um, well, some of the other topics that you'll hear about today have only begun in late in phase two or perhaps even uh, just getting their roots now in, in phase three. Our goal today is not to report on all of the programs and projects going on with EIS. There's been a number of them uh, to date, and there will be many more um, uh, projects to be completed over the next few years. Um, our goal is to give you a, a sense of, of the research that is being done and um, to really give you uh, a, an indication of where, uh, where the budworm outbreak is in relation to the Atlantic provinces. You will note three distinctly different approaches to 2023 uh, season um, in each of these provinces based on our, our unique budworm conditions. Um, they are, the, the outbreak is certainly um, not impacting each of us the same way. And so our approach to how we treat um, the programs will be uh, is different. And you'll see that throughout these uh, this meetings or this talk today. Um, from here on out, for the remainder of the, my my time with you, I'm gonna I'm gonna take off my communications hat chair, and I'm gonna put on my GMB Forest Health hat, and I'm gonna give you an update on the state of the, uh, of budworm in New Brunswick um, and the EIS program in New Brunswick. Afterwards, I'll hand it back over to Bernie, and he'll he'll, he'll uh, introduce my colleagues who will speak to the situation in their provinces. So to understand the New Brunswick situation, we first need to understand the role that Quebec's populations play. The current outbreak in Quebec is in, uh, began in the early 2000s, and it's made its way toward the province uh, of New Brunswick by about 2015. But as we know, moths fly, and uh, female moths that, have, uh, uh, are, that are egg-bearing uh, can take with them a large uh, potential uh, population uh, for the next generation to new areas. And so um, it's important to New Brunswick uh, to know um, what's going on in Quebec because it can affect our local populations. And so although the prop, you know, the, the populations hadn't moved to close proximity to New Brunswick until about 2015, the potential impacts of, of budworm coming from Quebec um, we're certainly on our minds many years uh, prior to that. 
Um, and, and and so you you see these images on screen. Um, the 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 one on the left is actually showing you um, not snow, which it has highlighted here um, in um, July, um, but a moth migration coming from Quebec that was picked up on satellite. And you can see the impacts of that migration event um, in, in a car dealership in Northern New Brunswick. And so it's very easy to visualize just how impactful a potential migratory event could be. Um, those handfuls and handfuls of moths, there was, there was you know, probably upwards of a billion moths moved in that, um, that, that one migratory event. And so just a little bit more on Quebec, um, you can see these two images come from Quebec's 2022 defoliation report, which can be found online. And you can see the, the link uh, below um, to the ministry's website. The image on the left shows the current state of defoliation in Quebec, and that's roughly 9 million hectares in size. Um, where the graph on the right shows us or tells us that 2021, for the first time since the outbreak began in Quebec, there was a, a slight decrease in the overall area defoliated uh, in Quebec. Um, the important thing for New Brunswick, uh, from a New Brunswick perspective, is that there was a decrease in the lower St. Lawrence region, both in terms of the area impacted, but also the severity impacted. So if you were to go back through those Quebec reports, you would see a lot more uh, orange and red area impacted in the lower St. Lawrence region. And that played directly into the, the seeding of those populations uh, here in New Brunswick. Um, Encouragingly, uh, in 2022, we saw another reduction in population or in, in defoliation in Quebec. And, you know, defoliation is, is a, a proxy for, for those populations. The less, the less budworm there are chewing and, and defoliating the branches, the less defoliation you'll see. Now, one thing that's worth noting here is that in Quebec, much like in New Brunswick, um, we have seen a... Um, a shift in technology for, for monitoring budworm. And we we're able to start using uh, satellite technology to have a more accurate capture of the overall area. And so the what you're seeing here in, in Quebec is ultimately a more refined um, capture of defoliated area. Um, nevertheless, it is a solid sign that the populations are uh, or have been declining, which has taken a little bit of the pressure off of New Brunswick. So with this context in mind, I'm now going to transition to um, what the New Brunswick uh, outbreak has looked like over the course of the EIS program. Um, and I'll finish off by uh, showing you where we are at to today um, leading into the 2023 season. So on screen now, what you're seeing is essentially our four phases or our, our four years of EIS phase one and phase one was a small program that was um, focused uh, solely on New Brunswick. Um, we had very little budworm uh, in, in the, the start of this, but we knew that it was coming. And so in 2014, we had a small almost test program uh, in Northwestern New Brunswick, where we were able to make sure that the, you know, the aircraft and the program, um, you know, that hadn't been operational since, um, you know, the, the, the last budworm outbreak many years ago, that, that we understood what we were doing and, and what the approach was, and that the researchers could establish, you know, the, the research protocol, and so on. And so it wasn't really until 2016, that we had a big uh, kind of uptick in the, in both the, the budworm in New Brunswick, but also in the sort of the first uh, real research improvement that was that was visual uh, and obvious. And if you look closely at the maps that you see here, um, 2014 and 2015, you can tell that the the research blocks uh, were very blocky. They were straight lines. They were, you know, defined boundaries, um, often using um, cutoff points that that made sense, like roadways, etc., as as kind of blocking tools. In 2016, you can see that we, we had improved our, our process and we went to a more landscape level uh, approach where we were more concerned with 
both the population and um, the, the host species. Um, and so this was a big step forward for us. Over this four year period, our, our treatment blocks uh, increased steadily from about 4,400 hectares in 2014, all the way up to about uh, 147,000 hectares in 2017. So we could see the program was certainly rising. In phase two, which began in 2018, um, the program switched from a New Brunswick-based approach to an Atlantic-based approach. There was a recognition that budworm was going to continue to rise and spread. This program seemed to have some real merit uh, in terms of the approach and that the research and the, and the approach could benefit all of the Atlantic provinces if, we were, if they were to be involved. And so at this point was when we started to see the other provinces really um, join in on the program. Um, 2018, um, in, in 2018, the program reached what will become, at least to this point, um, the largest program in New Brunswick uh, of this, of this uh, uh, phase, reaching uh, 222,000 hectares in treatment area. Uh, this surpassed all previous treatment uh, combined. So it was a big year and we kind of expected things to keep rising as predicted by um, the researchers um, who have modeled the, the population dynamics for us. And so just as we thought we were in for this massive battle in, in 2019, um, the populations crashed. Um, we ended up treating less than 10,000 hectares. Um, the, you know, the, the foliation levels um, dropped dramatically. Um, and so we, we were kind of left scratching our heads as to why that was. And I'll leave those, uh, you know, the, the conversation about that until later on. Um, but as we saw thereafter, we had this slow but steady rise again in 2020 and 2021 um, as, 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 uh, as the populations began to uh, rebound from that collapse. Finally, uh, or as we expected, or, or as we didn't expect, um, you know, as populations were rising, we expected 2022 to have a slight increase again. And of course, we get another nice little crash in populations. Um, and that was, uh, again, interesting. Uh, we're starting to learn a little bit about why these populations rise and fall, um, but not necessarily uh, finding a way to predict them ahead of time. This has been great for New Brunswick. Um, it's been, you know, because of the, the fact that we've managed these populations so closely, the, these, um, these crashes have been really meaningful uh, in terms of how we approach the next year. Um, and in fact, it, going into 2023, which is this upcoming season, you'll see the map on the bottom, uh, the bottom right here, we have a very small program um, scheduled for this year. Um, only 1,500 hectares is scheduled to be treated. This is the smallest program on record. Um, it, it's certainly uh, much smaller than we had, had planned on doing um, at this stage in the program. And uh, I think it's a real testament to, to the impacts that the program has had. Um, I, haven't, I haven't really spoke about defoliation throughout the New Brunswick phase of this, although I spent most of my time speaking about defoliation for Quebec. And that's really because we've had such a small impact of defoliation in New Brunswick. Um, we, we had one year where we saw about 1,100 hectares of moderate, um, uh, light to moderate defoliation. But in most years, we've seen less than 2,000 hectares across the entire province of budworm defoliation. And again, I think that's a strong indication that the program has been working well in New Brunswick. So where we go from here, um, you know, we have cautious optimism that the program is, is on its way down. You know, there's two years left of phase, of phase three. We're hopeful that in New Brunswick, at least, we'll be able to maintain the populations at or, or even below the levels that we're seeing today. Um, we will certainly continue to monitor at the efforts that we have. Um, and maintain support for all of the research that's going on that you're going to hear about a little bit later on. Um, at this point, I'm going to end my presentation and I'm gonna hand it back over to Bernie who is uh, going to take us to our next presenter. That's Bernie. great, Drew. Um, 
very, very interesting uh, overall view of what's happened in uh, New Brunswick over the last nine years. Um, just waiting for uh, Jeff to uh, share his screen. Um, and just a reminder while Jeff is doing that, that uh, any questions for Drew should be posted in the, the Q&A and we will get to those uh, after all of the presentations are uh, completed. So your uh, presentation, oh, should should introduce you. Yeah, um, so Jeff is gonna give us the update for uh, Newfoundland and uh, Labrador. Um, Jeff is the supervisor of forest insect disease and fire control for the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And uh, your presentation is up, Jeff. Looks great. And uh, please go ahead. Thank you, Barney. And uh, thank you, Drew, for speaking a little bit about uh, the Quebec, uh, I guess, uh, history, because I didn't include it in my presentation because. I figured that you would do so. So good, good. Thank you so much. So I'm just going to go down through my presentation and I, I, I like to begin by just bear with me for one second. My apologies. I loaded up the wrong presentation. So getting used to uh, presentations online, uh, this is a good way to adapt to uh, things uh, quickly. Everyone kind of adapts live to this stuff. But, but once again, thank you again, Bernie. My apologies for loading up the wrong presentation. Uh, this is my update on Newfoundland this year. Um, I always start by acknowledging everyone that helps because this is a large program. And it's not just the Newfoundland government, it's the, all the collaborator, collaborators from the Healthy Forest Partnership, the CFS, to scientists, to academia, that really, you know, make this Healthy Forest Partnership succeed. And, and in, in my mind, it's, it's a true success. So thank you to everyone. In terms of Newfoundland, I'm glad Drew had recognized that every province is, is dealing with the outbreak by their unique, I guess, local geographical and, and uh, management challenges they face. So we've been involved in, in the Healthy Forest Partnership really since phase two, but we didn't really enter into a, a treatment program until 2020, where we treated uh, 32,063 unique hectares. And um, in 2021, that sharply increased to 135,514 hectares. And again, in 2022, um, that increased again. So where we're primarily treating is along the, the province's west coast of the island of Newfoundland. And that's been subject to dispersal events from Atlantic Canada and local source populations that exist within the province uh, as Grosmore National Park is located on the province's west coast. If you were to look at last year's program, we, we built 150,000 hectares, 150,700 hectares. And what that means is we treated 141, 487 unique hectares. And some of those hectares had populations that were so high that they really needed to be treated with a second application. And I'll show you some of the results a little, little bit later. Um, year after year, we track uh, how the forest is developing in terms of shoot development, in terms of larval development. So last year was a bit of a cold, wet spring. So the program started a little later than the previous year. So we really didn't bring, begin treatment options, operations till June 17th. But I'm happy to report that we had great success in, in terms of uh, the treatment success. So if you were to look, we, we do we do all kinds of surveys before we actually begin treatment, make sure that we're treating uh, where we need to treat, when we need to treat, and this improves our effective effectiveness of this. So if you were to look at the bars on the left, 
they're really the benchmark data from the, the, the pre-treatment information that we collect to see how many lar healthy uh, larvae are there before treatment. And then with bars on the right, the gray ones, they are really the ones that we go in after treatment to see how many healthy larvae still exist after treatment. So as you can see, areas north of Grossmore National Park had uh, a, a good treatment success. And as you, you migrate around our, our four different operating areas, areas east of Grossmore National Park had uh, good treatment success as well. You see a nice trend line there that shows in various treatment blocks. And, and the numbers on the bottom are, are numbers that are associated with treatment block numbers. So they're not plot numbers, they're, they're the summation of the results from the block, which is uh, another thing I'd like to point out. So if you look at the areas south of Grossmore National Park, you see that we've got good treatment results there as well. And um, when you look south of the Bay of Islands, this is an area that kind of showed up this year in this year's control program. And I'd like to speak to the successes of treating early and being proactive in the successes of, of this, this program. When you go in and you treat early and proactively, when those populations are just on the rise, like we did in South of the Bay of Islands this year, what you see is those areas do not show up in treatment programs uh, in, in subsequent years. So you kind of see the treatment program just kind of marching around the landscape. So when we move forward and we talk about next year's program, we will not be uh, treating in areas South of the Bay of Islands. So that shows, you know, good treatment success. And when I had mentioned earlier, we treat single application versus double application. You see that the single application, we, on average, we got a 78% reduction in healthy budworm populations compared to a 93% reduction in areas that we did a double application. Now I'll caution you with these results because there was very limited area that we did the double application and that's only the results of five plots. So there, there's a lot of weight on each one of those plots, but it still does go to show that when you do a double application in areas that's got higher than average pop, one populations, a double application treatment is, is successful. So on an annual basis in the province, we really do a series of three different surveys. We do a pheromone survey, which really is a male moth capture survey it's a it's a lure that's placed in a trap to really be an early indicator of where your rising populations are so that later in the year, the year when you want to do your fall forecast survey where you're actually collecting branches it really focuses your survey but i will point out here on the bottom left hand side of here and, and this will get back to what drew was talking about how provinces are subject to dispersal events from other provinces and in 2020 there wasn't a treatment program in, in quebec and subsequent years, they did do treatment programs, which really kind of leveled out, you know, the male moths that dispersed into the province. So in 2020, although we entered into a, a, the treatment program, we, as soon as we treated, we were inundated with more moths that came from other provinces. So that's just a, just a good graph to show you the effect of that dispersal event on the province of Newfoundland. But in terms of our averages from one year to the next 2021 to 2022, no real change in male moth captures in our, our pheromone survey. In terms of more work we do with our partners in our pheromone survey, we, we put a series of automated traps and we partner locations up and down the province's west coast. And we track that year to year. And that allows us the ability to really track when moths are dispersing into our province. When you look at all the numbers from 2021 to 2022, you really only saw a jump in the areas uh, in the southwest coast here in one location. And on the northern peninsula, you saw a bit of a jump. Now, from this year to that year, we had troubles with pheromone trap last year, but we've got one more pheromone trap this year. But for all intents and purposes, this is uh, some of the largest populations that we have to manage going forward in, in the St. Pine Road, Port Saunders area. I always like to uh, show the work of our good partners from the automotive, automatic pheromone traps. 
And uh, this is some work that's done by Dr. Jean Noel Cando, and it's just shown migratory or dispersal events that are occurring on the northern peninsula from local source populations. And you, you can see that, you know, moths are migrating around uh, north of Grossmore National Park, where some of our higher populations are, and within Grossmore National Park nor northward. So that's our most active area within the province. In terms of damage done by by uh, spruce budworm, um, we 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 did not have damage reported before 2020. In 2020, we had 3,319 hectares reported in our survey, which climbed the next year to 65,000 hectares. This year, we've got 155,000 hectares reported in our survey. Um, we kind of changed our our survey methodology this year. So we kind of had to adopt the new survey methodology because uh, the central forest fires took all the helicopters. So we started with a helicopter and then we had to use remote sensing technology, which was new to our staff. And then we had to use observations from our fall sampling. And uh, all, all of those really uh, make up how we arrived at our numbers here. So it'd be interesting to see as as we, we continue to use Sentinel to map our, our surveys to see, you know, there's going to be a, a prior learning recognition piece. So every year now going forward, as we use this remote sensing, um, our staff will get more comfortable with it. And, uh, you know, we'll look for new tools and new techniques and new tricks to, to hopefully automate some of that in the future. But in terms of uh, severity classes, what you're kind of seeing is uh, an increase in severity of defoliation from one year to the next. So you see stuff that was in the moderate class last year slip up to the severe class. Things that was severely defoliated last year slip up to severe now with mortality showing up. So 43,641 hectares in the moderate class, 91,218 in the severe class, 21,000 uh, 88 in the severe with mortality uh, of the entire survey. I guess one third of that exists within Grossmore National Park, which is this area right here, all kind of concentrated in that location. So uh, an increase again in severity. So this is net, net area. In terms of our fall forecast, I had mentioned our, our pheromone survey really governs our fall forecast. So for those that may or may not know what a fall forecast is, we actually go out and collect branch samples in the forest at the same locations year after year after year after year. So we can track that information from one year to the next to really figure out what the true population change is. And at that point in time in the budworm life cycle, it's a really small larvae, it's called an L2. So you'll hear me refer to L2 sometimes going forward, but that's what I'm referring to. So we had a small increase in, in the, our L2 sampling from this from the previous year to this year, uh, provincially. But when you look at the leading edge, this is where the majority of the higher populations are. So in those 407 samples, we saw a bit more of an increase, but not that much more from from the previous year to, to this year. So it's up to 15.97. And in terms of the early intervention strategy, the threshold for, for being considered for treatment is typically around seven L2 per, per, per branch. So we're, we're still in, in, in a, a proactive mode in much of Western Newfoundland. So that's, I'm happy to report that. When you look at, the L2 numbers from 2021 to 2022 in my four main operating areas. We had really great success in the southwest coast. We saw it decrease down to 4.4 L2 per branch. South of Grossmore National Park, much of that decreased down to an average of 7.2. So areas south of Stephenville and south of the Bay of Islands, this is the south of the Bay of Islands, will, will, will not be within the next year's control programs. Uh, we had positive results again 
in the areas east of Grossmore National Park that decreased down to 9.7. But we did see an increase on the Northern Peninsula, which is largely related to dispersal events from Grossmore and local populations, maybe even Atlantic Canada. So the um, large focus of next year's control program, of course, will be on areas north of Grossmore National Park and areas directly adjacent to the boundaries of Grossmore National Park. Now, this is what I call my L2 heat map, really shows areas that have an L2 value higher than seven and uh, up until my top value. So this is the Western edge of the island. And this is where areas, I guess, our populations continue to be elevated. Dispersal events affecting areas on the Great, on the great Northern Peninsula. I wanna highlight that EIS treatments in 2022 was probably the most effective year yet. I'm really happy three of the four operating areas all saw decreases in L2 values. And I guess research on the effects of source populations will determine the effect of not treating in Grossmore National Park. So a lot of research questions are being asked about that. That's more really outside my wheelhouse. Uh, but you will see the concentration of, of L2 populations is really in that area I had mentioned on the northern peninsula between St. Line Road and Port Saunders and down around Grossmore National Park as well. Um, that L2 map plus the susceptible forest, which is basically spruce fir forest, that can be built into a model to determine what control programs look like, is how we arrive at what we forecast should be protected. So we really scale, I guess, this L2 number and our uh, susceptible forest, and it gives us a treat prior, treatment priority mo model number. And that's what we use to really go forward. Learning everything that we learn from New Brunswick uh, is what we try to do, adaptive forest ecosystem management. I think every year as we go forward, we'll learn something from our previous year's program and we'll apply it and, and always continually make uh, our program better. So we ran five different management scenarios. Scenario three, this is, conceptually the, the area that uh, was uh, proposed and selected for treatment. So in the next steps, we have to finalize the treatment blocks. We're working with the stakeholders on a daily basis, working with FPL, Forest Protection Limited. We're working with uh, uh, industry as well. But the focus will be to highlight the, the highest priority uh, forest within that footprint of that model and treat 111,000 hectares northeast south of Grossmore National Park. And, you know, since we're all really open in terms of communication, so we've, we've got our communication strategy here in the province. We, we try to engage effectively with all stakeholders. We'll update our pesticide operator's license. We get a new stakeholder list to engage with. Our website will go live on May 1st. Our 1-800 number will go live on May 1st. Our municipal letters will go out to all those communities that are directly adjacent to treatment areas. This allows us to have um, open communications before the treatment program begins. We put treatment uh, signage out there with treatment maps in the forest adjacent the treatment blocks we, we publish in the local papers we, we put it out in social media and when the aircraft start to arrive on site we do daily updates and all throughout the treatment program we do daily updates we do public service announcements on treatments when they're going to complete and of course we keep our 1-800 number on online for a month for two months post treatment so Anyone can call in and ask me any questions they want free of charge. And with that, I would like to thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And hopefully, you know, um, a lot of people got, you know, some great information there. Thank you. Oh, well, that's great, uh, Jeff. Um, real nice update. I 
kind of like your your heat map. That's that's a nice way to visualize where the where everything is. Um, if Dan could get his uh, presentation uh, loaded. Okay, that's that that looks good, uh, Dan. So our next presentation or will be from uh, Dan Levine from uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, Dan is manager of risk services, fleet services, and forest protection division division for the Nova Scotia Department of Natural Resources and uh, Renewables. So uh, Dan, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Bernie. Thanks, Bernie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to provide a spruce budworm update for the province of Nova Scotia as part of this year's EIS uh, annual general meeting. Uh, in the provincial updates this morning, uh, you will hear that, or you've heard that each jur jurisdiction in Atlantic Canada is really at a different point in time with respect to managing spruce budworm. Uh, New Brunswick has been on the front lines with other EIS partners over the last nine years. And despite the large outbreak occurring in neighboring areas of Quebec, they've successfully utilized the EIS to prevent a spruce budworm outbreak in, in their province. Uh, the province of Newfoundland and Labrador has been actively engaged with other EIS partners over the last three years. And despite repeated uh, spruce budworm migration pressure from populations in Quebec and high source populations in Grossmore National Park, uh, they are making progress in reducing spruce budworm populations elsewhere on the island. And here in Nova Scotia, though we've seen indications of spruce budworm populations building, up until last fall, populations have really remained at low levels, not requiring any management. So as observed in other jurisdictions in Eastern Canada, the spruce budworm has caused more damage to spruce fir forests in Nova Scotia than any other forest insect pest. Uh, during the last outbreak in Nova Scotia, 70% and 20% of the spruce fir volume was lost on Cape Breton Island and in Cumberland County, respectively. This equated to a total loss of 24.7 million cubic meters of wood. Uh, based on an annual softwood harvest of 2.7 million cubic meters, this equates to a 10 to 11 year supply of softwood. Uh, projections of potential future losses over a 50 year period have been estimated at 43.5 million cubic meters, an economic loss of 6.8 billion, and an increase in CO2 emissions of 28 million tons. So beyond forest level economic and climate change impacts, spruce butterworm outbreaks also cause ecological and socioeconomic impacts. The brightly colored 10 kilometer grid shown on this map show the areas that historically have been impacted more by spruce butter in Nova Scotia over the last 100 years. These include the North Shore and Cape Breton Island, specifically Cumberland County, portions of Colchester County, Picto and Antigonish County, as well as the counties of Inverness and Victoria in Cape Breton. So what has the province of Nova Scotia been doing to prepare for the return of higher spruce budworm populations. Like other provinces, we conduct annual monitoring for spruce budworm. In 2017, the province also initiated the spruce budworm management framework to determine how to best manage for spruce budworm in the future. The province continues to follow the science on spruce budworm management and has participated in the early intervention strategy and the healthy, and the healthy forest partnership. We've conducted a tabletop exercise to plan for a mock EIS program and we've continued collaboration and consultation with our partners. The spruce butter monitoring surveys conducted in Nova Scotia are very similar to those conducted elsewhere and similar to my colleague Jeff Monty from, from Newfoundland and Labrador and, and Drew Carlton from New Brunswick. Uh, our forest health team uh, uh, just want to acknowledge all their efforts. And so the information that I'm presenting on this slide is, is based on a, a lot of the work that they, they, they've done over the years. Um, aerial surveys and or the, or the use of satellite imagery to map the extent and severity of defoliation, uh, fortunately, uh, to date, has not detected any spruce butterworm damage in the province since the collapse of the last spruce, out, spruce butterworm outbreak in the late 1980s. We have also had no reports from other partners 
Uh, so we were off, you know, very often we're in, in contact with private woodlawn owners, Christmas tree growers, I, I naturalist uh, partners, the public, and uh, we haven't had any reports of spruce 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 budworm damage from from our partners. But despite this, uh, as it in, indicated in the top graph, we still have observed an increasing trend in the percentage of pheromone traps that are positive and in maximum trap catches. And as indicated in the bottom graph from branch samples collected in the fall, we have also seen an increase over the last four years in the percentage of positive sites with overwintering second instar larvae and in the total number of L2 that we're finding. Last fall, for the first time since the late 1980s, spruce butter populations have reached levels requiring management in Nova Scotia. A total of eight locations with moderate spruce butter populations at or above the EIS threshold of seven L2 per branch, represented by the orange dots on the map, have been, and been detected on the west coast of Cape Breton Island. The highest site had an average of 13.2 L2 per branch. While the overall area associated with these eight locations remains small, these populations have the potential to grow and expand in the absence of management. For this reason, the province needs to finalize its decision on how it will manage for this major forest insect pest. Fortunately, in 2017, the province of Nova Scotia initiated the spruce budworm management framework. As I indicated, the overall goal of the framework is to evaluate how to best manage for spruce budworm when populations increase again. This framework has been actively engaged with a broad range of stakeholders over the last five years. The six working groups identified on this slide have looked at five different spruce budworm management options and their impact or benefit on various ecological, economic, and social values. The EIS or early intervention strategy is one of the five management options that has that have been evaluated. The risk management committee comprised of the six working group chairs has also prepared an overall recommendation. This recommendation is now being reviewed by the steering committee comprised of def deputy ministers from the seven provincial departments shown on this slide. In addition, formal consultations on this recommendation are also being conducted with the MICMAW. Information from uh, the steering committee and from the consultations with the MICMA will be used to inform the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables and in the making of a final decision. I want to thank you uh, again for the opportunity to uh, provide an update on, on what's happening here in Nova Scotia with spruce budworm. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'd be ha happy to answer them during the question and answer period or you can contact me directly using the contact information that's shown on this slide. That's great. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for uh, a nice overview of uh, what's happening in Nova Scotia. So if you could stop, uh, perfect. So we're now going to move to uh, the second part of uh, our workshop, which is the uh, research updates and the first uh, update will be given by uh, Dr. Rob John. So Rob, if you could uh, put your presentation up there. Um, Rob uh, received his PhD in biology from University of New Brunswick in 2007 and he's been with the Canadian Forest Service in Fredericton since 2009. His research focuses on insect plant interactions population and community ecology, and the development of management strategies for forest insect pests. And Rob is going to give an overview of the early intervention strategy over the past uh, eight, nine years. So uh, Rob, it's, uh, it's all yours. Bernie, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine, Rob, and your presentation is up and looks good. Excellent. Thank you. All right, thanks everyone. Um, yeah, so we're gonna be switching to some science here. Uh, I'm going to be talking a bit about um, the efficacy of the program to date. Um, oops, just a second. There we go. Um, but I'd like to start, I mean, part of defining how effective the program is is understanding what exactly early intervention is. Like, what are we trying to accomplish with this program? 
Um, and to keep it as simple as possible, I mean, we are basically, it's a slow to spread program. We're trying to suppress hotspots to slow or stop outbreak spread. Um, at least at this point in, in the strategy, we're not trying to wipe out the entire outbreak. We're really just trying to control its movement <clears throat> and control its expansion to other parts of uh, Atlantic Canada. Um, and the analogy we often use for this is this whack-a-mole strategy where essentially we're trying to keep these populations low on this leading edge of the outbreak, in this case from Quebec for New Brunswick. And the idea is that if we play this whack-a-mole game, up in that northern part of the province, we can prevent these hotspots from rising in other locations within the province. Um, and in doing so, we end up with very small treatment areas and also very small footprint in terms of the impact of spruce budworm. Um, I'm gonna start just by looking at really the big picture. Uh, there's gonna be a bit of overlap with some of Drew's work, um, but we're gonna take a bit of a deeper dive into that data. Um, you know, some of the big questions we wanna understand if we're looking at efficacy, does early intervention strategy prevent outbreak spread? Um, one of the best tools we have right now, um, aside from our own sort of scientific uh, detailed surveys, are these provincial surveys done by the Department of Natural Resources in all the Atlantic provinces, where they're essentially looking for these hotspots. Um, and you can see some people here that are doing some of that pole pruning work, collecting branches that they, they wash for these L2 larvae, uh, creating maps like this uh, that give us some sense of um, where these spruce butterm hotspots are, are cropping up. And, you know, and basically any spot that's over six larvae per branch is characterized as a hotspot. And fortunately, with this type of survey, we have treatment areas both inside or we have samples both inside and outside of treatment areas. And it gives us some idea of how effective the treatments are being. Um, so I'm going to start a little bit later than Drew did. Uh, 2016 was a really big year for the early intervention strategy program in that it was the first year that we had this really huge inundation from Quebec of immigrant moths uh, that deposited very, very clearly deposited a lot of moths or a lot of eggs rather down in northern New Brunswick, especially. Um, it was so intense that we had these areas up, and this is from Camelton, where we had these carpets of moths sort of located there. Um, and I know as us going up there to survey, you know, you saw these moths that in a season where there was basically no budworm in terms of larvae, we go to these locations and there's budworm moths everywhere. So it was a very distinct event. Um, and it was the L2 surveys. The, these are the, the hot spots, all those, the black dots. Um, the hot spots that we ended up with um, sort of led to these treatment areas. And you can see a lot of sort of hot spots in outlying areas. Those had small blocks surrounding them that you just can't see on the map. But the main bulk of the area you can see is in northwest New Brunswick and in that uh, northeastern New Brunswick. Um, and these were treated with two insecticides um, that I'm not going to go too much into, but it was basically BTK, the bacterial insecticide, um, and tebifenicide, which is basically a hormone mimic that causes the insects to molt early. Um, I can go a little bit later into some of the details in the, uh, um, the round table if people would like to know more about the insecticides. But for now, just know that these were the insecticides we were using. Um, sorry, so we had our treatment area. You can see it wraps in a lot of these blocks. We go back in the fall and we look at where the L2 are. And you can see inside those treatment areas, we had pretty good efficacy. Uh, very few insects are left within those blocks. Uh, and most of the spots seem to sort of rise in the areas outside of it. Um, except for a few of these plots. Uh, these particular sites ended up being treated a little bit late. The larvae were already pupated. So um, we, we didn't, we were concerned that there wouldn't be as much efficacy and that seemed to be the case in, uh, in these particular sites. Um, but the way the treatment works or the way the program works is, you know, we have these new hotspots that have risen outside of those blocks. Those end up becoming the locations for the treatments the following year. Um, and this is the biggest uh, treatment area we had of about 220,000 hectares in 2018. Um, we came back the following years. This is looking a little better. And you can see up in Quebec, we still have very high densities up there um, in terms of the budworm. But if you look sort of even just right across the border in New Brunswick, very few spruce budworm in these locations. Uh, so this is when it really dropped low to about roughly 10,000 hectares of treatment. Time went on. Hotspots outside of those blocks. They, again, we're continuing this whack-a-mole game. Um, treatment had a few more hotspots sort of crop up in 2020. They were treated in 2021. 
almost 100,000 hectares. And um, I, just for the sake of time, I'm not going to continue the rest, but as Drew, Drew explained, this continued on until the populations collapsed to what is looking like this year, about 2,600 hectares. So sort of basically two, two little mini cycles. You know, and so this really characterizes, the, you know, the whack-a-mole analogy is very appropriate indeed, I think, for, for, for the way the strategy works. So that's, I mean, looking at that data, it looks, you know, very, very compelling in terms of that the program seems to be doing some things, um, especially if you contrast it against what was going on just to the north and lower St. Lawrence, where this outbreak continued to sort of go on. Um, where they were doing primarily foliage protection. Um, you continue to have the, the uh, you know, strong protection of the forest they were controlling, but the areas surrounding that the population still tended to uh, were increasing in some areas and sort of expanding in others. Um, but uh, so my group, I mean, these type of things are very interesting to us as scientists because it gives us an opportunity to really dig deeper and take a look at you know, some of the underlying things that are causing EIS to work um, and other things that are causing these populations to collapse. And of course, like one of the reasons we wanna look more carefully, we do wanna have this efficiency of controlling these populations, but we also wanna limit these non, potential non-target impacts of things that we don't want to have any impact on. You know, we want most of the natural processes to be working. Um, and so in the course of our work, we did very detailed surveys of populations through, both throughout the year, um, but both inside and outside of these treatment areas. And one of the things I wanna emphasize is that, you know, when we, there, there's sort of this misconception that these treatments are like incredibly powerful and it's mostly the treatments that are wiping out the spruce budworm in these areas. And I mean, that couldn't be farther from the truth. Most spruce budworm, in a uncontrolled outbreak even, die of natural causes. And this is just a general case for insects in general. Um, there are a myriad of ways in which insects die. There's parasitoids, bird predators, disease. Um, there's Most of the trees are defended with varying levels of toxins that they use to sort of keep spruce budworm from being able to eat them effectively or ruining their digestion. There's of course weather events of all sorts of kinds that can have effects on the insects. And when you get from the start of the season to the end of the season, there's a very small percentage, sometimes like four to 5% of the insects that actually survive through that year um, to make it into the following season and lay eggs. I mean, and the reason why these, they still seem to perpetuate is because they lay so many eggs that they can offset that incredibly high mortality. And so this is a really key part, like point to make for something like an early intervention strategy. And that we are not trying to inflict really high mortality we're just trying to sort of fill in that little sliver of, of a little bit more mortality into that sliver of survivors to decrease those populations and prevent them from, you know, having as many eggs that would lead them to continuing an outbreak. Um, and so, of course, then therefore, one of the questions for efficacy of, of the early intervention strategy is, can we actually add this mortality into that tiny sliver of survivors? And our data for the last six years, um, is that it is pretty clear that in treated areas, we're adding much more, or at least five to 10% more mortality than are in the untreated areas. And you can see even in this figure, this is just from the spring when the larvae start feeding to the time they come out of adults. Even then you're looking at in just untreated areas, anywhere from 65 to you know 95% mortality in an uncontrolled population. Um, and we're just adding through EIS, just a tiny bit of extra mortality. Um, which to, to, to that population during that stage. Now, of course, one of the things in adding this mortality, we wanna be as precise and specific as possible. We don't want to overlap and be interfering with those other things that are killing spruce budworm. Um, in a sense, we don't wanna kill, so we don't wanna kill a lot of spruce budworm. We just wanna, we wanna kill enough just very efficiently within that tiny sliver. Um, so part of the goal of the program is to conserve that high natural mortality because it has such a high impact on the populations. Um, I'm not going to be talking about this particular facet of this, uh, though Dr. Veronique Martel, I believe after me, is going to be discussing it more um, in, with the angle of parasitoids in particular, I think. I also have a colleague, Dr. Jonah Sura from the University of New Brunswick, who is tackling this from the bird predator angle. Um, so he would be another resource for this to understand this part as well. Um, so 
one of the big questions is, can we offset? Um, so we can inflict this mortality into that, the, that larval feeding stage. The big question we've always had from the beginning of this program is, can we do enough to offset the immigration of moths coming from other locations, in particular areas like Quebec, um, where there was still sort of a burgeoning or a, sort of an ongoing spruce butter outbreak. Um, and as it turns out, um, as it turns out, um, we actually had a very, a very strong impact overall and we're able to offset that as well. So this graph basically, you're looking at population growth rate. You can see a dotted line going across the middle. Um, any points that are above that mean the population was rising from one year to the next. Anything below that line means populations were declining from one year to the next. Uh, and that's from, again, from 2017 to 2022. Um, and you can see in every case, even with immigrants coming in from Quebec, uh, in most cases, we ended up with negative population growth rate, especially in the treated areas, very negative population growth rates. Um, and this sort of explains those trends where we see the populations basically collapsing. Um, it's interesting to note, though, if you look at the untreated areas, only in two of the years, maybe three years if you include the one near the line, were those populations either maintaining or actually rising. Quite often in our untreated areas, especially towards the latter, the latter couple of years, we can see those populations declining even in our untreated areas. And I think this is a really important point to understand with the early intervention strategy is that uh, unlike a normal sort of treated and untreated experiment, our areas that we're treating, the implication of this is that we are having an impact on untreated areas in that we are removing the local sources of potential immigrants through pushing those populations down. Um, and so, it makes it a little more difficult to sort of make that argument for, uh, for or, or to, to, to show that sort of treated and untreated impact unless we make direct comparisons with Quebec. And th this sort of takes me to a sort of a final point, which is one of the more interesting things about EIS is, as Drew alluded to, um, when one of the things that we're really interested in is this, these sort of periodic sort of micro collapses of these local populations in Quebec or in New Brunswick. Um, you know, especially we noted these in 2019, we had a little sort of increase again, and then another decrease in 2022. Um, and it's worth noting that these sort of patterns that we saw were mimicked to, to a large extent on the North shore in, or sorry, in the, uh, the lower St. Lawrence area. The difference between New Brunswick and, and Lower St. Lawrence was that in Lower St. Lawrence, those populations were still very high. So you have, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent decline. Those populations are still above a level where they're causing huge amounts of defoliation compared with New Brunswick, where when you have these local declines, they almost disappear from the landscape. You know, and I think this is part of one of the things that we argue is that this is one of the reasons why we have uh, EIS is so effective. It's really that combination of using the treatments to keep the overall populations low to take. So when we have these uh, periods where we have these local collapses, which we believe are associated with these other, some variations in these other weather or other types of uh, mortality factors, um, we think weather in the spring is especially potentially important. When we have those types of things take place, if we keep these populations low, that could lead to local population collapse and potentially longer term sort of periods between these treatments. Um, and we think that's one of the more important, one of the most important sort of aspects of EIS in terms of its sustainability over long periods of time. So just to a, a, a summary. Um, so is early intervention working to answer the question we posed at the beginning? Uh, the results are very encouraging, I think, in pretty much every way that you look at it. Um, it, as, I, as I wanted to reiterate, uh, and I try to say this as much as possible, it doesn't take a lot of added mortality to have really big impacts. And this is one of the things we've learned during this program. Um, one of the things we're still waiting to try to figure out, can we outlast the ongoing outbreak? Can we do EIS better? Can it also just add an extra question to that? Uh, can we also outsource this to places like Newfoundland and Nova Scotia and continue having those types of successes? Um, and these are remain open questions. Um, I, I just like to take one moment before I finished uh, to make a big thank you to Dr. Sarah Edwards who prepared 
over the weekend, in many cases, a lot of the figures that I showed today, uh, the graphs, and I just wanted to express my appreciation to her. She's one of my colleagues at CFS. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave everything else to the question period. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks, Rob. And uh, our next presenter will be uh, Dr. Veronique Martel. Um, yeah, just a reminder, Rob mentioned it, but uh, please post your questions in the uh, Q&A and we will get to those uh, at the end of the session. Uh, Veronique is a, uh, who holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from University of Montreal and a Master's and PhD in Entomology from McGill University. She did her doctoral studies in behavioral and physiological ecology of reproduction of parasitoids. After her studies, she did two postdocs in Europe, uh, first in Sweden and the second one in France. She started as a researcher at the Laurentian Forestry Center in 2011, where she is working mainly on the ecology of natural enemies of forest pests, including the spruce budworm. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, the title of Veronique's presentation is Evaluating Non-Target Impacts of the Early Intervention Strategy. So uh, Veronique, please, uh, please go ahead. Merci. Euh, bonjour, je vais donner la présentation en anglais, euh, mais euh, mes diapos sont bilingues, puis n'hésitez pas à poser des questions en français dans le, la boîte de questions. Um, so, I will, I, I will talk about the non-target impacts of the early intervention strategy. So, by non-target impacts, what we mean is any impacts we can have on something else than spruce bodworm. Um, I'm going to focus especially on caterpillars and their parasites, and I will uh, uh, explain why uh, in a, a few minutes. Uh, just to mention that that work was part of uh, the master um, master work of uh, Valent Valentin Glaus. So uh, if we look at the history of spruce management, what we can see is that the products that were used uh, against spruce bodworm has been changing with time. So if we look like back in the 50s uh, with DDT, it was um, a pretty nasty product, I can say. Um, so it had a lot of uh, non-target impacts because it could affect a lot of things besides insects and besides spruce bodworm. So uh, birds, fish, uh, all kinds of animals. Um, but because of a public pushback mainly, uh, the pro products has been changed and, and the, the, um, the rules has been changed. And nowadays there are only two products that are uh, approved in Canada tibifenazide and BTK, as uh, Rob mentioned it. And what we see mainly is that the specificity of the product has been increasing with this change, so with time. So these two products, uh, the main thing to remember is that they both affect only caterpillars that are feeding on it. So that's, that's a huge improvement uh, compared to the old products that were used. So BTK is, is maybe the, the the most well known. Uh, it's a bacteria, so it's a bioinsecticide, uh, and it's uh, a bacteria that's naturally present uh, in, in soil in the forest. It has a half life of a few hours to a few days, and only uh, effective on caterpillars because of the uh, the pH of the uh, digestive tract. Um, Tebifenazide, the other product, is mimicking a molting hormone. So because it's mimicking a hormone and hormones are pretty specific, it again only affects the caterpillars feeding on it. Uh, and what it will do is it will um, um, make the insect molt when it's not ready to, so eventually causing its death or at least malformation that will prevent from uh, surviving long. Uh, it, it's half-life, so, so uh, sorry, by half-life it's like the, the time during which uh, the, the product is active, more or less. So it's a bit longer than, than BTK, but it's still quite short. So if we look in the literature at different studies on spruce bodworm, but also on other uh, species, uh, what we see is that insecticide could potentially affect different things 
They could affect the abundance, so the number of caterpillars we find in the forest. It could affect the richness, meaning the diversity, so the number of species that are there. Um, but their impact will depend on the caterpillar species uh, and will have different recovering uh, time. So meaning that if a population of species is affected, how long will it take for it to reach back to the level it was before the insecticide treatment? Um, we also want to make sure, as Rob mentioned, that we're not affecting the natural enemies. We don't want to affect the mortality that's already occurring in the population. So um, I'm, I'm mainly interested in parasites, so these insects that will lay their eggs inside other insects. Um, and what we know is that the parasitized caterpillars will feed less. And because both insecticides have to be ingested, it means that parasitized caterpillar are less affected by uh, insecticide. So they will uh, not die uh, from it most of the time, which is a good thing because we want to preserve these natural enemies. But one, what we want to make sure too is that we don't have indirect impact. So here you have a, a spruce bottom caterpillar being attacked by a non parasitic. So they will have, uh, attack spruce bottom in June. But what happens is that they will come out in July uh, and look for another caterpillar species to attack because spruce bottom is no longer there as a caterpillar. And then it might come out in August looking for another caterpillar, another host to attack. And what we want to prevent is affecting, for example, the July host, uh, because that would mean that the parasitic population would crash during the summer. And then next year, for example, spruce bottom could rise higher than it was because the natural enemy, so not the natural mortality Rob mentioned, would drop. And that's something, of course, we don't, we don't want to do. So the objective of, of the study is to evaluate these potential non-target impact on the caterpillars and the parasites community. Uh, so what I'm presenting here are a specific part of, of my project, so this two-year study, but we've been studi studying that since the beginning of the early intervention, and we're still uh, doing that. So we're taking samples every year. So of course, we looked at uh, where the insecticide treatments were, because uh, we want a, a sample where the early intervention is taking place. Uh, and what we did for that particular study, uh, there was insecticide treatment in 2018. So we selected five sites that were treated with each insecticide, so BTK and tebufenazide, but also control sites, meaning that there was no insecticide treatment. Um, so we did, we did that the year of the treatment in 2018, but also one year later, when there was no uh, insecticide treatment, because as the recovery period can be different from different species, we wanted to have the opportunity uh, of seeing if there was an impact, uh, what were the population of the caterpillars back to their regular level one year later. So what we did in these 15 sites, uh, we did different type of sampling to get as many caterpillars as possible, uh, living in, in as many niche as possible. So we did some, uh, some branch sampling here, uh, collecting branches from both uh, deciduous and uh, coniferous trees. We did some branch beating, so any shrubs or small tree that would be uh, in, the, in the understory, but also visual inspection, meaning that they would be in transect in which uh, the staff would look at any plant. So it could be herbs or shrubs or small trees again, and try to find any caterpillars. And all these caterpillars will be uh, sampled once per month from June to September, because we don't want to cover only the period when we do the treatment and spruce buzzworm is there, but also uh, all the summer seasons. So we want to make sure to capture uh, uh, all the species uh, in these sites. So we collected for uh, this year uh, a total of uh, 744 caterpillars. So we did molecular um, uh, um, techniques uh, to evaluate that. I'm not going to go into any de details of that technique. Uh, there's a, a, a published paper on it. So if you want to know more, uh, I, I could send you the, uh, the the reference to that. But basically what we did, so we would kind of just crush these caterpillars individually, and we would uh, know if the, it was a spruce bottom or not, and if it was parasitized or not. And then we could do further an analysis to know the species of both the caterpillars and the parasitoid. 
So here are the results. Uh, so for all, all my graphs, I'm gonna explain them all, but just uh, you have a color code. So the BTK is in blue, the control is in gray, and the tibifinazide is in orange. So basically the colorful ones are the, are the sites treated with insecticides. So if we look at the richness, so again, it's the number of different species. So a measure of diversity of these caterpillars, you have the number, uh, of these species that we found in both year. Um, and what's important is uh, there was no difference between the control without insecticide and the insecticide treatment and that for both years when the insecticide was applied and a year later. Um, we do have though a difference uh, between the two insecticides. So we have a higher richness in the BTK sites than in the tibifenazide. But again, these two are not different from the control, uh, which was our main question uh, for this, uh, this study. Um, something we saw also is that we had more species in September for both years and for all sites. Uh, and there was no difference uh, between the two years. So be having an insecticide treatment one year or looking one year later, we have exactly the same pattern of, uh, of uh, richness. Now, another thing that is important to look at is the abundance. So again, that's the number of caterpillars, whatever the species uh, they belong to. Um, and here we have absolute, absolutely no difference among all the treatments. So. Uh, control, BTK, or tibifenazide for both years, they're all the same. So we had the same number of species, whatever the, um, the treatment we had. There was no difference again among the years. And same result as for the richness, we have more caterpillars in September than the other months. So that was for the caterpillars, but as mentioned, we also want to make sure we don't have an impact on parasitism, so on the natural mortality. Um, so we're looking here at the rates, so the proportion of caterpillars that were parasitized and not on individual species because um, identifying parasites is often challenging even with um, molecular techniques. So the two years here were uh, slightly different. So we analyzed each year separately. So we're gonna look at 2018 first, so the year when the treatment uh, was applied. And what we see is that the control is not different from the two insecticide, as we've seen before, although there's a, a small difference between BTK and tibifenazides. Um, there is more parasitism in, in September. So there's a trend here with September, as you can see, uh, and more parasitism when there's more spruce bodworm in, in, in the site. And that makes sense because spruce bodworm is a host that's available and abundant in these sites. So it increased the uh, number of parasites uh, th that can attack and can develop. So that's for the year of the treatment. When we went back one year later, uh, there was no more difference among BTK and tibifenazide. So all the sites were similar for parasitism one year later. And the same thing, more parasitism in September and when there's more uh, spruce bummer. So uh, what can we get out of these data? Well, the main thing and the question was uh, if if there's a difference uh, when we treat with insecticide compared to uh, the control, and there was no difference for any of the thing we looked at. So the controls were never different from the two insecticides. So that's a good thing, and and that's what we were hoping for. Uh, but but that's what we got. Um, something also interesting um, uh, and and good, I'd say, is that. Uh, Abundance and richness were higher in September, and that's the time when the insecticides are not active anymore because it's been a while since the insecticide application. So that means that when the higher diversity is in, in the forest, uh, the, the, the insecticides are not active anymore. So that's pretty good. Another thing to remember is that the treatments are done by aircraft. So they arrive on the canopy and most of the products stay on the canopy where the spruce bottom, most of the spruce bottom is. But um, from another stu study we did, and I I'm not showing the results here, we've seen that most of the diversity of the caterpillars and most of the parasitism was in the understory plants. So that means that most of the caterpillars are somehow protected just by their habitat in the forest. So again, that's also a good thing. Um, something I wanted to note from the literature is that 
reducing spruce bodworm density could actually be good for the other species later in the season. So once spruce bodworm is around, there's not much caterpillars around at the same time. Uh, and if we don't uh, act on the spruce bodworm population, uh, it will feed a lot of the foliage available. So it's actually depleting the resource for later uh, species during the summer. So a lot of studies, not just on spruce bodworm, but also on spongy mud, so on outbreaking species have shown that it could be good for the other species if we lower the level of an outbreaking species. Um, when we compare with other studies that did find some impact of uh, insecticide treatment on, on, on other insects and on, on caterpillars especially, what we see is that they were the ones on spruce bodworm were often done on higher spruce bodworm density, so meaning that the the like the picture of, of the forest and the ecosystem might have been different at that time. Um, the insecticide we used were at lower concentration than most of the studies, but also some of these studies are against spongy mud, so in more deciduous forests or mixed forests where the diversity is higher. So the potential of affecting other species is also higher in these cases. Um, so in conclusion, the, the, the early intervention uh, treatment we did uh, did not affect the caterpillars or parasitism in New Brunswick within the context that were used. Um, what we've seen, the small difference between BTK and tebufenazide uh, could be caused by the difference in half-life. But again, just to remind that it was not different from the control. And the way we use this strategy is actually uh, probably limiting the non-target impacts we have because um, EIS focus on hotspots, so it's often quite fragmented, which means that it's not a continuous forest that's treated. So um, caterpillars, other species, will not all be affected in the area, and they might also recolonize because, because of the fragmented uh, treated area. Also, treated sites are pretty uh, highly concentrated in balsam forest and spruce because that's where we find spruce budworm. And these forests have a lower diversity than mixed forests, including a lot of deciduous. So that also means that we potentially affect fewer species uh, because fewer species are around. And uh, there's rarely two consistent consecutive years of treatments. Uh, so that's good because it allows for recovery if we did impact any species, but it can happen. And uh, I'm currently, that's the thing I'm looking at, uh, sites that have been treated two consecutive years. But I, I have to tell you, it's actually difficult to study because it's pretty restricted the number of uh, uh, areas that are uh, treated two consecutive years, but we're doing it right now. And finally, I just wanted to mention that there's also similar work done in uh, Newfoundland by Joe Bowden, uh, and, but using light traps, and he also did not find any difference between um, the, uh, the treated sites, even for consecutive years. So thanks a lot. Um, if you want to know more, the uh, study has been published. It's open access, so it's free, but you can also send me an email if, uh, if uh, you, you have any question or uh, in the question box. Thank you. Well, merci, Véronique. That's very interesting work and, and important work. Uh, that brings us to our last presentation, and that will be by uh, Dr. Michael Stasny. Um, Michael, if you could load up your, uh, your presentation. Uh, Michael is a forest insect ecologist. Uh, he received his doctoral degree in ecology and evolutionary biology from Cornell. Um, and he joined the Canadian Forest Service as a forest insect ecologist in 2016, uh, after a three-year postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Ottawa. He is a broadly trained community ecologist with research experience from three continents, specializing on interactions between insects and plants and their implications in the context of environmental change. Michael's presentation is titled Spruce Budworm Pest Management and Ecological Integrity of Forest Watersheds. So Michael, if you could get your uh, presentation up. Thank you, Bernie. Can everybody see it now? No, yeah, I think you can see me. Interesting. Let me try that again. We can hear you fine though. Yeah, and, I, and it says that I'm sharing a window. So I'll stop sharing and I'll reshare just in case.
Huh? How is it now? I'm I'm still seeing my uh, my mugshot. Usually, when you share, Michael, you can pick. Um, you have to pick which you're, if you use multiple monitors, which monitor you want to use. Yeah, or I if just you want one. to like, share that screen. That's what I did, but let me let me try. I think I shared a window, so let me just try to share the screen instead. How is it now? That's better if you could put it in. Uh, Perfect. There you go. All right. Okay. Go ahead, Michael. Thanks so much. So I'll, I'll change the gears here a little bit and talk about um, looking at more ec more broad ecological and ecosystem impacts of spruce budworm uh, with a special focus on forest watersheds. And this is work um, that we're doing in collaboration, especially with my uh, colleague at the Great Lakes Forestry Center, Eric Emelson, but there are a bunch of other people involved, including academic um, collaborators. So traditionally, uh, spruce budworm outbreaks have been really seen in this context of benefits um, and risks. And the risks um, have been primarily seen as non-target effects that um, are involved in or potentially involved in uh, some of the previous treatments or current treatments. And Veronique covered that extremely well in the previous presentation. And then the benefits of, the treat of those treatments obviously would be the protection of the wood supply and, and therefore the economic benefits of, of treatments um, just when it comes to uh, forest industry. And one of the uh, obvious other implications of these really large scale uh, periodic disturbances is that they have really large ecological and ecosystem consequences, but those have been mostly unstudied and ignored. And this is the, the focus of our projects looking at a whole bunch of different um, potential effects or impacts of these outbreaks, or conversely, um, the effects of, of managing them um, through EIS. So when you think of um, the spruce budworm outbreaks, the most obvious first impact is that the feeding of the caterpillars is reducing the canopy cover by defoliating the trees. That changes inputs into the soils and the streams because all of a sudden, um, there's caterpillar poop, as well as fragments of needles and so on, changing what's going into the soil within a relatively short amount of time. And of course, you also end up with some reduction in tree growth. And if, if the outbreak lasts long enough, defoliation is severe enough, you have tree mortality eventually. And that's changing not only conditions and what's happening in the soils, but a whole variety of abiotic conditions all the way to the streams, the hydrology of the streams, it's impacting the habitats and the, the biodiversity that, de that depends on these forest habitats and stream habitats. It's also changing a variety of ecosystem processes, including uh, nutrient cycling. And it's shifting um, the food webs um, as a result of some of these changes. And that's what our project was, is trying to, uh, to elucidate. And so we're, we're basically looking at the effects of defoliation in terms of what happens in a, in a forest watershed. And so we have a study that's been going on since 2018 or 2019 really um, in the Gaspé region of Quebec where we have a, an experimental gradient of defoliated watersheds, each of them fairly large, 600 to 900 hectares. And we're treating half of the watersheds with the BTK application, very much like what's used also in EIS and leaving the other half of the, of the watersheds untreated so that we can see what are the impacts of spruce, spruce budworm outbreak when it's not controlled through treatments? And we've been following um, a number of different things in both the streams and in the soils to try to understand what is happening as a result of, of this defoliation or what's happening when you're preventing defoliation through the treatments. This is just a schematic of some of the predicted responses that we see. So I've already mentioned that as you have um, an outbreak of the spruce budworm, you start to lose canopy. You're also producing a lot of budworm frass, which is just a scientific name for budworm poop. And that's changing soil carbon and the nutrients, but it's also changing what happens to the streams and the things that end up in the streams. The loss of canopy is also changing the, the forest habitat that is, let's say, used by birds, for example, but the birds at the same time benefit by feeding on spruce budworm um, when it's really high in abundance. And 
all of these things are then cascading into impacts on water chemistry and nutrients on benthic food webs. So that just means all the critters that live on the bottoms of the streams, um, all the way to biofilms and microbes that are really important in nutrient cycling and stream, stream water, and all the way up to the fish communities that live in these cold waters. Um, so brook trout and all the way up to the salmonids. And so I'll show you a series of graphs of some of our results up to date that are starting to help us understand what these ecological impacts are of, of spruce budworm on forest habitats, um, and especially on these forest streams. So one of them, one of the more obvious ones, and, and you may already predict that, um, are impacts on hydrology. So in other words, what happens to the stream flow? And we're finding that as defoliation increases, the streams have a higher discharge and higher runoff. Um, and so they have their hydrology changes to the extent that they're now basically flowing more water through the system. And that has important implications for sedimentation and erosion, as well as for uh, the stream habitat quality. So as sedimentation and erosion increases, that changes the, the variety of the habitats available in the stream to things like fish and, and all the food webs that the fish depend on. And this is work by one of the uh, undergrads working at McMaster with our collaborators. We're just finishing up um, this work. Um, we also see that the stream temperatures increase as a result of defoliation. As defoliation increases, the streams start to warm up and you end up with elevated uh, water temperature. And this again has really important implications on the food webs and especially in these cold water organisms like brook trout um, and, and salmon, Atlantic salmon. And this is work by a, a master's student, Maddie, that's uh, just finishing up. We're also starting to see impacts on algal, algal growth. So the growth of algae in the streams, and this is part of the regular food web. You don't have to pay too much attention, attention to this graph, but really what it's showing is that as the amount of defoliation increases, the algal biomass also increases as a result. So the, the defoliation promotes uh, the production of these algae in the streams. I'm not showing results on, on nutrient shifts in the stream. We haven't really seen so far any changes in nitrogen or phosphorus, but we do expect those to start to change as well as you end up with tree mortality in some of the watersheds. And we've been seeing that after a number of years of, of defoliation, because at that point you start to uh, produce more nutrients that go through the soil and end up, end up in the streams as, as dissolved um, nutrients, including dissolved organic carbon. And, and that would be the forest soil then acting as an important um, source of the, of the carbon in the stream. And all these changes in the nutrients, as well as in the algae, which are then some of the primary producers in the streams, have, again, important implications for the food webs and what's happening to the nutrient cycling um, in the streams and also to carbon sequestration, which is an important component of, of um, climate change mitigation. In collaboration with um, a professor at uh, the University of New Brunswick, Steve Hurd, we're also looking at the impacts on soil processes and specifically um, soil, car soil carbon sequestration. So um, I'm not going to show too much in terms of the results there, but we're basically expect that as this input of frass and needles um, increases as a result of defoliation. And we're also changing the abiotic conditions of the soil because now we have um, thinner canopy above. And that means more solar radiation on the soil. It means a different rate of precipitation reaching, um, reaching the ground. It means uh, different snow melt, rate of snow melt in the spring. So all of those things are changing how um, microbes respire in the soil, how they're decomposing all the different things that are part of the soil the organic uh, component of the soil. And it's also changing the mycorrhizal communities of these fungi that um, associated with tree roots that are important in um, tree growth and, and balancing um, the flow of nutrients in the soil. And these would then of course have implications not only for soil carbon, but also other nutrients in the soil, um, as well as carbon sequestration that's important for, for um, climate change. So we're working on some of those responses currently in, in collaboration with um, UNB as well as uh, collaboration with Agriculture Canada. This is a complicated graph and, and you don't really need to pay too much attention to it other than 
noticing that from 2019 to 2021, you have the separation of these two spheres that represent basically the different kinds of bacterial communities. So what used to be a much more overlap in 2019, after several years of defoliation, you start to show divergence of these bacterial communities in defoliated sites. In other words, the, the type of a community changes. And we're also finding that they're changing towards using carbon differently. Um, so these are the stream, by, stream communities. And again, this is work by a master's student. And as these bacterial communities are changing, that means the food web or the, the base of the food web is, is changing as well, along with um, different um, dynamics for nutrient cycling in the stream. And you'll kind of, I'll, I'll return to this um, shortly again, because that has sort of downstream consequences for the rest of the food web as well. Um, and then those consequences really go all the way up to the consumers in the streams and, and a really prominent type of consumers in the stream of obviously would be fish. So in our case, we're, we've been looking specifically at brook trout. And what we're seeing is that as defoliation increases, they start to feed more on algae in the stream than some of the other uh, parts of the food web. And this has potentially implications for fish health and abundance. We haven't seen any real responses yet, but it could be that there are some lag times for that. But the other, uh, the other important thing to remember is that a lot of these effects we expect to be cumulative. In other words, as they happen in smaller streams, they accumulate downstream in, in larger rivers. And so that could be potentially quite important for things that we care about in, in some of these important Salmonid rivers uh, in the region. So we are following up on some of that as well. And this is work uh, by another master's student at McMaster. We're also looking at bird communities. Rob has already mentioned that these are important um, parts of the equation when it comes to the regulation of spruce budworm, commun uh, spruce budworm populations. Um, our collaborator, Lisa Veneer at the Great Lakes Forestry Center has been using acoustic monitors to um, uh, look at, to study uh, um, the abundance of especially warblers, but also other kinds of birds in response to spruce budworm outbreaks, because what we know and what she's also seeing this graph shows that as, as you increase defoliation, more of the habitat, available forest habitat for these birds is occupied by these warblers because they're responding to the, uh, um, the increased food abundance. All of a sudden there are all these caterpillars and pupae to feed on. But at the same time, as you have uh, the outbreak progress into um, tree mortality stage when you're really starting to impact the forest, we expect that that habitat quality would decline and the bird abundance uh, would also decline. They would move to somewhere else because the habitat would no longer be as suitable. Um, at the same time, you might have increase in some of the other bird types, uh, for example, woodpeckers who would be responding to the increase in all kinds of wood borers um, that colonized uh, the standing dead trees. And so these have important implications for not only bird populations, and that also includes some of the species of concern, but also generally, more generally, the forest biodiversity in these, in these areas that are impacted by the outbreaks. Now, just to kind of broaden the, the scope of this, because we've seen there, there's a variety of different responses and some of them probably accumulate over time. Um, but we also need to consider that spruce budworm is a natural disturbance as part of the system and happens every few decades. At the same time, this is in the context of, of the forests facing multiple stressors. There's harvesting going on, there's climate change, which increasingly will impact the forests in the region. There's occasionally wildfire, uh, wind throw, and, and all, kind of, all kinds of storm disturbances. And then of course, insects other than budworms. So for example, spruce, spruce bark beetle follows often um, um, outbreaks of um, spruce budworm secondarily. And so all of these impacts um, interact in forested watersheds and especially in the streams, they inherently accumulate. If you look at a watershed, um, such as the example I'm showing here, Within that watershed area, you may have um, several different stressors um, happening in different locations, but when it comes to the actual forest streams, you might see impacts of all of those things and interactively all of them um, 
at some downstream responses that you might be measuring, whether it's um, water quality or water temperature or parts of the food web or, or fish communities. And the forests and the forestry that we're doing in them have changed since the last outbreak. And so this is why it's really important for all this kind of research to be happening now, because we're trying to understand not only how spruce budworm is impacting our trees in the present and how we can control it better, but also how um, some of these impacts cascade down to ecosystem level processes and, and indicators. And the, uh, the scenario of these uncontrolled outbreaks, because that would be one implication of if it's a natural disturbance, can't we just have it unfold the way it used to for hundreds of years? Um, in addition to some of these other stressors, we also know that there are often secondary pests that follow the outbreaks. And then the other um, important component of uncontrolled outbreaks tend to be that we then react um, by conducting salvage harvesting to uh, salvage whatever wood can, and can still be used for timber. And of course, salvage harvest has, has really dramatic implications for things like stream hydrology, water quality, and so on, because it's a very sudden um, even though localized, but sudden um, impact through the actual operations and road building and so on, on, uh, on forest streams. And so one of the uh, reasons why we have things like early intervention strategy is to allow us to think of a more proactive um, way of controlling pests, um, uh, spruce budworm especially, um, in the forest so we don't have to resort to the salvage harvest as a sort of a last resort reactive management of our timber resources. And so just to kind of go back um, in this progression from a, a healthy forest that then becomes um, affected by spruce budworm and potentially starts to see some tree mortality and that's basically what we're hoping to avoid. We're starting to think more critically about what that means for the habitat integrity, what it means for the processes that are important in forest systems, including streams and some of these ecosystem services all the way to um, let's say recreational benefits that we derive from, from forests. And this is some of the research that we're um, interested in continuing um, and learning from. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Thanks so much. Ah, that's great, Michael. Uh, great presentation, very interesting work. Uh, look at the QAs. Um, had a couple here, but I think they've been answered. Question about the um, presentations, whether they'll be recorded. They will be recorded and we will be providing a link to the people who uh, registered. Um, I'll keep that open. I don't, so uh, if anybody has any questions, please uh, post them in the, the Q and A. Um, I, I've got the, I've got the, 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 the stage here. So I'm, I'm going to ask a question to, to Michael. Um, what, what was the level of defoliation, the, the comparison between your, your treated and untreated sites there? Was it fairly high or moderate or what, how, how bad was the, the, the defoliation in those watersheds? See, Michael might be frozen. I think he is, Bernie. We may have to okay. wait for him to come on back online. I do see a question there in the in the Q and A. Okay. I'm not sure yep. if you can see it there yet. From Krish. I don't see it. I'm going to close and open again. No, I don't. Oh, oh, wait a sec. I got to scroll down. Yeah, from, from Krish. Um, she was only able to catch the last two presentations. Was there any information about the post spruce budworm forest succession? Uh, I'm working on spruce budworm in a spruce budworm team in Ontario and want to access the FMU level and provincial economic impact of spruce budworm damage. Any suggestions can be directed to her email. Thank you. So that would be for a follow-up unless somebody has anything to uh, to contribute right now. 
think that's probably one best handled by uh, by the research scientists, uh, uh, Rob yeah. or Vero or or others, and maybe we can uh, put them in contact. Okay. Um, I'll uh, I'll pop another one then um, for uh, Jeff Motti. Um, Jeff, you had that uh, that heat map, and uh, you had that nice red. Uh, well, not nice, I guess, but a big red dot in the uh, northern peninsula. And I was just wondering the um, the defoliation or the 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 L2 counts in uh, Grossmoor National Park uh, are were they accurately represented there, or because I was expecting it to be a little bit hotter than uh, what it showed. You're 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 muted, Jeff. Okay. You ever heard the expression "beat yourself out of a house and home"? <laughs> okay. It's just a Newfoundland expression. Because I I think we're seeing because when we sample, we have a, a, a sampling procedure, and a branch branch sample is a certain size. So I, I think one trend that I'm noticing in Grossmore National Park is because we've been protecting outside of Grossmore National Park on the Northern Peninsula for years. We're doing a really good job of keeping foliage on the trees for the most part. So there's a lot of, lot of, lot of places for those bloodworms to be placed on the individual needles throughout the trees on the Northern Peninsula between Bateau Barrens and say uh, Port Saunders. So there's more habitat per branch. So I think what you're seeing is with the increase in defoliation, you're seeing less foliage per branch sample so naturally i believe this is my opinion uh, that for that reason you're seeing a bit of a decrease down there as well okay no i, I, I was just wondering because I, like i said I, I was expecting uh a bit more color there yeah i'm not seeing any other questions the numbers are still quite high in grossmore national Park, though Okay. And typically, when we're doing our heat map and our modeling, for the most part, we're excluding Rosemont National Park. Um, good. Uh, Dan's got a question. Uh, I, I can't type a question in there. I only get I only see the question and I have to answer. So I just wanted to make a comment uh, uh, to add to to Michael Stastny's presentation is, you know, here in Nova Scotia, one of the issues that we've had we we get a lot of invasive insect species coming into the province as well. And, uh, you know, he mentioned the native um, um, spruce beetle, which is, you know, it's a, sec it's a secondary pest usually looking in after budworm uh, has uh, stressed and defoliated trees and it'll cause more mortality, you know, in, in spruce. But we're also concerned about, you know, what the impact will be of brown spruce longhorn beetle. It's now here in the province and we don't really know, you know, what kind of secondary impacts that this, this particular species will have as well. So. We have not only our native species to be concerned about, but some of the invasive species that are coming into the province and how they're going to interact with, with, uh, with, uh, with the spruce budworm. Just wanted to make that comment, Bernie. Yep. No thanks. Good, 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 uh, good comment. Bernie, I just got a text from Mike Stastny. He uh, his laptop died, and he was wondering if you could let him back in. <laughs> uh, how do I do that? Well, while we're waiting for, for Bernie uh, or, or perhaps Natasha to help us out with that, um, maybe just as the chair, I, I'd, I'd take a couple moments here and, and give a couple closing remarks from my end before we start uh, seeing some participants dropping off. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for, for uh, both presenting today, but also for the participants for, for um for uh, uh, joining today, we've had, we had over a hundred participants, uh, which is excellent uh, outreach for us, and and that's um, really important that we are able to uh, speak to the to the masses, so to speak. Um, the Healthy Forest Partnership really is um, a unique partnership of the federal um, government, provincial governments, um, universities, and other uh, non-government organizations. We have been working on this um, this um, shared interest for almost a decade now, and it will continue on for at least the 12-year program. 
Um, and it's been, a, I think, from all accounts, a huge success. If, if no other reason, just the amount of different voices and interest groups that have worked on this. Um, it, it is a science-led program, and, and you've heard from three of the scientists today, um, but I, I, I want to make it very clear that there is a, a huge uh, science team working on this program um, across not only Atlantic Canada, but through Quebec and Ontario and other, and other uh, areas as well. Um, and so it's, it's been a, 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 just a major endeavor. And I think one of the reasons why the program has been so successful is because the scientists have led the approach. Um, it has not been government-led policy that has, has dictated the, how we approach this, uh, this, this budworm uh, outbreak. The scientists have really steered the direction of it, and I think that's just you know fantastic. Um, this has been a proactive approach uh, to population management, and it, its goal has really been to maintain the populations at the low levels. You heard Rob Johns talk about how we're not trying to um, you know kill all the budworm; we're just trying to knock those levels down a little bit and let all of the other natural factors help maintain those populations below outbreak. And I think we've seen a lot of uh, evidence to suggest that, uh, that that can be a successful strategy uh, uh, for spruce budworm in Atlantic Canada, and perhaps for other insects around the world too. Uh, it'd be great to see if this uh, program is able to extend to other, to other um, insect systems. And I'm sure we'll see some, some version of that. Um, after nine years, we've seen a tremendous amount of, of improvements in how we've approached budworm management. And there was no way in the short time frame that we had today that we could really get into all of the details on how the hows and the whys. But there's a tremendous amount of information on the Healthy Forest Partnership website. And there's also the link to all of the researchers um, and all of the organizations that work on this Healthy Forest Partnership on the website. So if you're if you're listening in today and maybe not sure how to ask a question or prefer to do so in private, by all means, you can reach out to uh, us through the HFP website, and uh, we endeavor to get those questions answered in a, in a very short time frame. Um, with that, I'm going to just say thank you to everybody one last time for participating today. Um, Bernie, I'll turn it back over to you in case there is any other questions or comments that we wanted to provide. I, thanks, Drew. I, I don't see any other questions. Um, Michael, I'd, I'd started to ask a question before you uh, you lost access there. Did you hear the question that I was asking? I did not. I, my computer okay. crashed red during that time. <laughs> okay. Now, it, uh, I, was, I was just curious about the level of defoliation in your treated and untreated sites. Uh, you're, you're seeing some some differences there and I'm just wondering if uh, if it's if it's moderate light severe or just a combination of everything it's it's more of a combination of everything and part of it is because we uh, started off with an, a, a pre-existing gradient of defoliation that's just how the the outbreak sort of reached the area more from the northwest uh, but it's also something where the years differ often so that's pretty typical for uh, for outbreaks that they go up and down and, and levels of defoliation. So we've seen some years where all of our untreated watersheds would go to severe defoliation with really strong impacts all the way to uh, top tree mortality, basically. Um, and we've also seen years where uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot of a difference between treated and untreated watersheds just because the, the populations that year were quite low and the defoliation was quite light. Okay. Um, okay, thanks. I don't see any other questions, so uh, I think I'll, I'll join uh, Drew in thanking everybody for joining and uh, hope to see everybody uh, next year when we do this again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.